All right, here we're going to really talk a bit about the growth and decay factors, um, but we're also going to modify that original underlying structure of an exponential equation or an exponential function. You may remember in Algebra 1 doing some exponential word problems when you did maybe some type of a banking problem. You probably talked about interest rates or something like that. So it should be somewhat familiar. Here I have an equation written out and I tried to kind of keep some of the terminology um, and constants and variables the same as what we did in the last lesson. Here, instead of y or f of x, I have rewritten it as a of t. a of t, I'm just selecting letters that make a little bit more sense to the context of the problem that we would probably be doing. So this might be the amount of something, maybe it's the amount of money, maybe it's the amount of carbon-14, maybe it's the amount of caffeine or some sort of a radioactive element the amount of something after a given amount of time. Sometimes they use the phrase with respect to time. Maybe we'll refer to it as it relates to a certain amount of time that has passed. But more often than not, when we're doing these word problems, it's really going to relate to time, number of days, months, years, whatever. So this is our output. A is really the output, but we refer to it as a whole package, A of T, meaning the amount as it refers to time or in reference to time. Anytime you see with respect to x, with respect to t, that just means that is your input, your independent variable, your x, your domain, and this over here is your output or your dependent variable or your y value or your range. It will help you if you need to graph which thing goes on which axis. So this goes on your horizontal and this goes on your vertical axis. Now, here, underlying, we have y equals a base to the x. And instead of x, we are using t. And as we said before, t is really standing for time. My a is still going to be the same. It's our initial value. It's the amount we start with. a is right there. And our base is a little bit more complicated now. The base, there's that one I mentioned before, the original amount, 100% of itself. So if you have a savings account and you are earning interest on your savings account, well, you wouldn't want just the interest to be in your savings account when you came back to it later. You want the initial deposit to be there as well. And that's what this one does for us. And here is our rate. Now, often you'll first learn a separate equation. You probably remember learning A equals P, capital A and capital P, which was your principal or your primary investment parentheses times the quantity of one plus just r, close parentheses, to the t. But really that's silly because then you learned a separate equation after it, but really if you just learned this equation, it's the same equation as the simpler one. The only difference is you filled in a one for both of these orange values right over here. So this value, this b that I'm dividing my rate by, and then I'm multiplying the time by, this b value is the number of times the initial value is multiplied in a specific period of time, for example, one year. Now, this is really a simple way of saying it, but in a word problem, it'll present itself as, you know, you, learn, you earn 5% annual interest. So in one year, you're still getting 5% interest, but it's compounded monthly. That doesn't mean you earn 5% interest every month. You're still getting 5% interest for the year, but we're going to divide that interest by 12 and we're going to compound it every month. So it's going to affect our graph. It's going to affect our equation. So we divide the 5 by 12. You get a little bit of it every month. And then we also multiply my time by 12 because that's how many times in one year we compound the interest. All right. So you're going to have to look out for that. And we're going to do some comparing and contrasting in a few word problems so you really get the hang of it and hopefully we'll have some time either in this lesson or the next lesson to talk about mortgages and student loans and things like that so you can see how that interest um, piles up. Now in this step what we're going to do is just to make sure we still remember the equation. So what letter did I have written out front? I had A written out front but for right now I'm going to change it to that capital P I mentioned before, just because most textbooks and worksheets will probably look at it like that. So I want to give you both viewpoints, okay? Inside of the parentheses, 
what operation was between this part and this part? This was an addition. What number was written over here? That was a one. Over here, we had a rational expression. That means we had a fraction. What was my numerator and what was my denominator? The numerator is r, which is the rate as a decimal. And my denominator, I had written b. I'm going to use the letter that most textbooks will use, which is n. I've seen n, I've seen k, I've seen a bunch of different ones, but I'm going to go with an n right now. Then over here in the exponent, I had a product of two letters written in. One was really representing a constant and one was a variable. And that was the N and T. Now let's just write down what everything really stands for and we can keep it a little bit generic. Now do you remember what the left-hand side represents? The left-hand side really represents the amount of something with respect to the input value. The amount of something with respect to the input value. The lowercase a we basically just replaced with the capital P and that really stands for the primary amount, principal amount, they both start with P, so principal amount. So maybe we're talking about money, but maybe we're also talking about bacteria. You know, we could be talking about a lot of different things. R, that's going to be the rate as a decimal. So if we said a 7.05% rate as a decimal, some of you maybe learned just to move the decimal place twice to the left, so that would be 0 0.0705. Here I had written B because that's what I had in the other problem and then I decided to erase it. So maybe I'll put the B back for a second. I'm going to draw an arrow for what letter did I substitute in for the B value? That would be the N. And that's going to stand for the number of times interest in quotes because we'd be talking about something else is compounded in one measure of time. Usually in these types of problems, it'll be in one year. And then T, obviously then it's time or whatever we are relying on as our independent variable to get our dependent variable. Let's say you invest $900 at the end of sixth grade and it's gaining 4% interest annually. Annually will mean per year. Model this with a function. A lot of times when you're given a problem like this, what I notice is people really tend to read right over this part and instead of modeling it with the function, they do use a function to set up everything and solve immediately. If it asks you to model it or some other word that would mean the same as model, that means you need to really write out the equation that represents this situation with all the constants filled in and only the variables still written as letters. The variables are going to be the a and t. So only A and T should be in our problem as A and T, and everything else should be a constant numerical value. So what information does this paragraph give us that we can use? 
Let's pay attention to the numerical values. For one thing, I see the number 900. I see 4% interest. I see end of sixth grade. That sort of depicts some amount of time. Model the situation with the function. Is that really enough? Oh, I also saw annually. Okay, what letters are in this equation? Now, depending how you choose to write it, we can say that we have P or A, lowercase a that is. We had one plus R over N raised to the N T. So really these three letters, I need to figure out what they equal. P was our principal amount. Do you see what the principal amount is for this problem? 900. R is our rate as a decimal. Do you see our rate as a decimal in this problem? It's 0 0.04. And then N, N is the number of times the interest is compounded in one T, and T in this problem stands for year, so in one year. How many times is the interest going to be compounded in one year according to this problem? According to annually, that means just one time. And that actually simplifies things quite a bit. So now we're going to fill everything in. But before I do, I'm going to write up here the equation out with just letters. Filling in the value for our principal for P, or our primary amount. We wrote down what everything is on the side, so I'm just going to fill that in. We have 900, 1 plus 0 0.04. Now I really understand that we don't need to write over 1, sort of silly. I'm just writing it as good practice to help us memorize the equation. Raised to the 1 times T power. So again, that one and that one are not needed at all. So you may have remember learning, you may remember learning the simpler version, which was just P times the quantity of one plus R to the T. But really, those are the exact same equation. One plus 0 0.04, well, that's gonna add up to 1.04. That's why we tend to use that number right off the bat when we start these problems um, that are pretty simple and they just have a growth or decay factor. We'll see in some word problems when we get to the logarithm section. Okay, so we just modeled it with a function. Now we have the rest of the question. How much money will you have after one year? How much money will you have after eight years? So we have two things that we're trying to figure out now. So we're just gonna set up both equations. The amount of money we'll have after one year means that we're trying to find the A of one. That's how we read this. The amount after one year, and you write it like this. This means everywhere you have a T, you're going to fill in a one. So that gives us 900 times 1.04. And we know it's going to be a growth because the base is bigger than one. 1.04 times 900 does not require you to take out a calculator. This really reads as 104%. The number 900 is created with nine one hundreds. The 104% means we're increasing every hundred by four. 104 per 100. So that means I'm adding four onto this 900 for all nine one hundreds. What's four times nine? 36. So it's really going to be $936. That is not the interest, that is the money with the interest added on already. Oftentimes I see people just type times 0 
to find out what 4% is, and then they take that number and add it back onto the original. As we have these other circumstances where something's compounded monthly or quarterly, it's not as easy to do that. So that's why you need to get into the habit of understanding how the function works. After eight years, we're going to do the exact same process, except where we plugged in the one, we're going to plug in an eight. That means we could have found, if we did it the old way, where people multiply by 0.04 and add it back on, somebody would take 0 0.04 times 900, get 36. Add 36 to 900, get 936. Then take 936 times 0.04, get a certain amount, add that back on to 936, and repeat that until they've done it eight times. That's silly. Here, we have 1.04 to the eighth power, and then we also have times 900. Order of operations really matters here. Here, you could have gotten away with being a little confused. Here, you cannot. You have to do exponents before you multiply. So in your calculator, you're going to do 1.04 to the eighth power. If you have a button that looks like this on your calculator, you can potentially use that button. You would type in 1.04, press this button, and then press the 8, and enter. So if you have an iPhone calculator, it probably looks something like that, the button. That will give you this value. From there, leaving it on your screen with all the decimals in the calculator, you'll multiply by 900. If you were going to use a calculator something like this one, you would type in your calculator 1.04. There's that X to the Y button I was telling you about. You're going to press that button. So it's going to take the 1.04 and raise it to the now eighth power. We're going to hit enter. That's 1.04 to the eighth power. Now, instead of multiplying by 1.04 over and over and over again, this already did it for us. And now we multiply it by that initial value of 900. And you press equals, and we have 1,000. $231 and it's money, so we round out to two decimal places, and this would be 71 cents. A of 8, amount after 8 years, equals 1,231 dollars. And 71 cents. Suppose you had invested that $900 such that it still accrues 4% annual interest. However, the interest is compounded quarterly. Quarterly means four times per year. Model this with a function. How much money will you have after one year and after eight years? I'm going to write down the basic equation first. And now I'm going to fill in the values that we're working with. What number did we say is going in for n? Four. Quarterly means four times a year we're going to find out how much money we would have in this way after one year. Now it says that we still accrue 4% annual interest. So in one year, you're still annually getting 4% interest. However, it's compounded quarterly. We still have that $900 investment and we're still dealing with one year and eight year. How different could this be? Now you're not gonna see 4%, 4%, 4%, 4%. So it's not like you're going to get this amount in two years. That's not how it works. Point zero 0.04 divided by four is
that's just the fourth power. Now that equals 900 times 1.01 .01 to the fourth power. If you had looked at it from this step, you might think that you were doing a problem asking if you had $900 at a 1% interest rate how compounded annually, how much money would you have after four years? However, we're clearly working with a different circumstance. I'm going to type in 1.04 raised to the fourth power. Then I'm going to take this amount and multiply that by 900. I didn't write anything down. I did not round it early. That gives me $936.54. The amount after one year will be $936.54. In the last problem, after one year, how much money did we get? $936. So this way, we got an additional 54 cents, even though we were accruing interest four times in one year, but we have to remember that that interest rate was divided by four first. So that 4% annual interest works out a little bit differently. Let's look at how much we would have after eight years. Again, we'll set up our equation the same way. 900 times the quantity of 1.01 raised to the thirty-second power. Sometimes when I'm feeling a little lazy, I just go up here and I'll rewrite the 32 right there. So I don't have to rewrite the whole line. 1.01 1 .01 raised to the 32nd power is 1.3749, yada, yada, yada. Take that number times 900, $1,237.45. The amount after eight years is equal to $1,237.45. How much money did we get after eight years when we just had annual interest? The amount was $1,231.71. If I wanted to know the difference, how much more money do we get this way? I would take this amount, subtract off $1,231.71. And that would be a difference of about $5.74. So it does make a bit of a difference. You do end up getting more money this way. However, by doing it this way, if you have a savings account, you might be moving money around. Maybe you take some money out. Maybe you put some money in. So your interest will reflect however much money you have in the account at that time. So I guess there's pros and cons to it for both the bank and the person with the savings account or whatever type of account this is. Here we're going to go back to the investment paying out 4% annual interest. That was the um, example six. How long, as soon as you read the phrase, how long, that tells you that you're solving for a unit of time. So that means T in our problem will be the only variable left when all is said and done. Every other variable should be filled in. How long will it take for you to double your investment? How long will it take for you to 
double your investment. Now, I want to mention that it's important to realize it doesn't even matter how much money we're starting with. The amount of time it takes to double $900 will be the exact same amount of time it will take to double $9, to double $5, to double a million dollars, and to double 20 cents. It takes the exact same amount of time in all of those situations. Just to prove that, I'm going to erase the 900. We're going to replace that with something. This is still our initial amount, the amount we started with, our principal, our primary amount. A, or A of T, is the amount at the end. If I were doubling the $900, what would I fill in for A of T? If I were doubling $900, I would write 900, and over here, 1,800. Let's say I call this amount question mark. How long will it take me to double the investment? If this is my investment, I'm trying to solve for how long it'll take for me to double this. Well, what's double question mark? Two question mark. It doesn't matter what your initial investment is, you're trying to make it double itself. Now we need to solve for t. It's the only real variable here, even though these might appear to be variables. What should we do first to get t alone? First thing you want to do is divide both sides by the question mark. If that were 900, we would divide by 900. If that was 25 cents, we would divide both sides by 25 cents. What will we, what will we be left with on the left after we divided two times question mark by question mark? We would have two because question mark over question mark is something over itself, which is one, equals, here they reduce or simplify, and we are left with 1.04 to the t power. Now, some of us might remember going over a few of the parent functions, and when we went over parent functions, we said that one of the parent functions we learned was the inverse of exponential. Later in this chapter, we're going to formally learn about this inverse. Do you remember what the inverse of an exponential is? It's a logarithm. Now in order to solve this, one thing you'd be able to do is to take the log of base 1.04 of both sides. The log base 1.04 and this 1.04, some magic happens and we're only left with t and the t is no longer in an exponent, it's a normal sized t, and we'll talk about that later on. And this right here will calculate to give me the amount of time necessary to do this. However, most calculators don't have a log base 1.04 button, so you'll learn another equation called the change of base formula, which will let us write, say, log of 2 over log of 1.04 or you could even use another button on your calculator, ln, which is the natural log. It comes from Latin, that's why the letters are in the opposite order, because the adjective comes after the noun when we use things that come from Latin. You punch those, sorry, right there, in a calculator, and it'll give you that amount of time. Now remember, this is for later. I'm just kind of doing a little foreshadowing. You could type 2 and then take its ln, divided by 1.04, take the natural log of that, but now I still have to hit equals and I get 17.67 years. 17.67 years. Another way I could type it in, and this is going to be really important in a later unit, so definitely pay attention, 
you could do log 10, but if you try to take log 10 of the number on the screen, you're going to get an error. If you remember, even ln, same thing. If you remember in the parent function at zero, there was an asymptote for log. What am I taking the log of? It's kind of like a square root. You don't take a square root of nothing. You take it of a number, right? So you want to put the number you're taking the log of down first. So 2 log divided by 1.04 log enter. You get the same answer, 17.67. I'm going to put this in front, so approximately 17.67 years. But we don't know how to do this yet. This is just a little foreshadowing of something that's to come. So how should I go about solving this now if I don't know how to solve using log yet? Everything that we solve algebraically is related to a graph. Solving the equation 2 equals 1.04 to the t is exactly the same as solving this system of equations by substitution. y equals 2, fill that in for the y here, and I get that equation. So you're asking yourself, when does the horizontal line of y equals 2 intersect the exponential function of 1.04 to the t? Since this is not something that I can just do in my head, I'm going to show you how we would do this using Desmos. Dallas, shush. Do you want to use Desmos? So Dallas wants to help with this. He says we're looking for that point of intersection right there, and he thinks I'm very silly, and that I should just use the computer or a calculator because this type of calculation is just too hard for a dog to do. He's right. We're going to take a little intermission to find out where those two graphs intersect each other, and we're going to use a computer to help us out. We first went to desmos.com and then we clicked start graphing. I'm going to change this into projector mode and hopefully we'll be nice and zoomed in. I'm going to pull the graph this way a bit and you'll see why in a minute. Now the first equation I'm going to graph is the line y equals 2. If I graph y equals 2, that's this red line right here, horizontal, with a slope of 0, going across at 2. Now the next line I'm going to graph, well not line, the next function, will be y equals 1.04 raised to the x. Now I know that this exponential function over here doesn't really look too exponential. But if I do zoom out a bit, and I could zoom out just like this, you will see there is a bit of a curve to it. Another way we could see this curve a little bit better is if we change our window. I'm going to show more of the x-axis. I'm going to go out to 100 on the x-axis. If we go out to 100, do you see how much better you see the exponential curve? Now I wanted to know when the red and blue equations would equal each other, and it's right here at 17.673 comma 2. This will actually go out more decimal places, but Desmos is just rounding it. So if I wanted to know for what value of t, t was my independent variable, which was my x-axis essentially, my horizontal. And then I wanted to know what value of t would cause those to be equal. I could get my answer by using Desmos, by using Desmos or a graphing calculator. For right now, I'm going to show you using Desmos but I'm also going to alter this a little bit. In an earlier step of the problem, I could have also done this problem by saying, instead of y equals two, I could have made it 1,800, and I could change this equation to 900 times 1.04 to the x power. Now you might think, where's my graph? It disappeared. Well, it didn't really disappear. I just really need to zoom out because my vertical stretch is huge. I have a vertical stretch of 900. Now since I already know the answer, hopefully you know the answer too, I'm going to change my dimensions, my x minimum, x maximum, my y minimum, and y maximum. Essentially I'm describing my domain and range.
change to fit this window to how I'd like it. I'm going to make my x go from, um, let's just do negative 6, just so I could see a little bit of the axis. And I'm going to go until 20. Now my y axis, maybe I'll go from negative 6 over here as well. And I'm going to go up to 2,000. Now, I'll even zoom out a little bit now that I see it. Here's my x axis, my y axis. Here's the line y equals 2. I'm not sorry, no. Uh, y equals 1,800. Here's the exponential function. And where do these two intersect? At the same input value, 17.673. Because the only thing that changed about each of these functions is what? There was a vertical stretch put on both of them. Since there was a vertical stretch put on them of 900, it only moved my graph vertically. So vertical stretch, we usually use A. So I'm going to go right there and put A times 2. A times that, I'm going to do a slider. And here, as I make my A value bigger and bigger, I'm going to let my A go as big as 2,000. And from 1. So right now my A is 1. That's how squished down my exponential function is. I swear it's the first one we graph. As A gets bigger and bigger and bigger, I'm applying a vertical stretch. My horizontal line simply rises, and my exponential function stretches vertically. When you stretch a vertical, I'm sorry, a horizontal line, nothing interesting happens. But here I'm stretching my exponential function. So how much did I stretch by? Well, I only stretched by 900, so I could stop once we get to 900. And that's the graph we just had on the screen. And in every step of the way, this value would always be 17.673. That's the amount of time it takes. And until we learn how to use log or LN, natural log, and that button on the calculator, we would have to use graphing to solve. So if you have any homework problems that require us to solve for an exponent, keep in mind that for now, you're going to use a calculator, a graphing calculator, um, and more particularly, probably Desmos.